the question was asked: Does the Torah view it as a man purchasing a woman? Because the the wording in the mi, in the beginning of the Mishnah in Tractate Kiddushin says Aisha Nikneis Bishlosha Drachim. So it certainly sounds like you buy a woman. You know, you buy a cow, you buy a slave, you buy a woman, right? That's what it sounds like until you analyze it a little bit more closely, and you realize that it is nothing of the sort. Now, um, Kiddushin is actually because we view it as such a right to marry this woman, as such a privilege, so the Torah developed a two-stage process. When you do Kiddushin, what you're acquiring is the right to be married to her. Kiddushin is, I am hereby designating, I am hereby, you're, you're selling me the right to be the one to be no say you, to ultimately marry you. Kiddushin is the precept. You have to first do Kiddushin, it's a two-step process. And if you think about it, the two-step process actually shows a lot of honor and respect to the woman. The two-step process is first, we're going to agree that, I, that you, you're giving me the right to marry you, and then I'll marry you. Kiddushin, and then Nisuin. It's true that after Kiddushin, we, the, the Torah says that legally, once she's agreed to that, once you've given her the ring or whatever it is, then uh, biblically she is uh, she's prohibited to marry anyone else. She's considered engaged halachically, biblically, engaged is Kiddushin. And it's Yehark Val Yavar, you know, it's, a, it's, it's biblically prohibited to, to marry her, uh, anyone else to marry her at that time. Um, but nonetheless, the Kiddushin, no one in his right mind would say you're buying the woman. Obviously, she's, uh, she has her rights, she's still a free person. What you're buying is the right to marry her, if she chooses to give you that right. That's the term Niknet, if you look closely at the the Mishnah and then the Gemara and Kiddushin. And then she's... I didn't hear you. No, the woman is never the man's property. Never. There is an agreement between them uh, in marriage and there is, there are different responsibilities that he has towards her and she has towards him, but she is never his property. No. Uh, on the contrary, this is one of the radical things that did not exist in societies throughout the world for most of world history where a woman under Jewish law has many many rights uh, no other society for for most of world history there was no other society where a woman could demand the courts get her a get a divorce contract there's no other society which protected her rights to land and to assets when you get married, you sign a contract which delineates what assets she's bringing into the marriage so that if the marriage dissolves, she will, we're ensuring that she gets those assets back. Uh, she has a right to own land, and on the contrary, our sages set it up so that uh, gifts that her parents give her remain hers in the event that you'll, she'll die, which happened often. I mean, women died much more frequently than men because childbirth is a very dangerous thing. Um, so in the event that she'll die, you marry a second wife and, and then have more kids. So our sages set it up that whatever gifts she received from her family will remain for her children. And this was done in order, again, to help the woman so that her family will be more inclined to give her gifts. They shouldn't worry, who knows who's going to inherit the gifts I give my daughter because people generally saw many of their children die in their lifetime, especially their daughters. Uh, childbirth is very dangerous, you know, the, when you don't have antibiotics and when you don't have C-sections and, and when you don't have ultrasounds and when you don't have the medication and a way of ensuring that no part of the placenta stayed inside. You know, um, I still remember uh, 25 years ago where the custom was still that you wouldn't say Mazel Tov until after the placenta came out. So today, most of you will never hear of this minug because a minute after childbirth, they give the woman a shot the shot causes her stomach to contract, and about a minute and a half after childbirth, the placenta comes out. But once upon a time, it wasn't so simple. And so you, you wouldn't say mazel tov until the placenta came out because you still didn't have a guarantee that she's going to live. I know women who, who were on the verge of bleeding to death because a little piece of the placenta stayed inside, which caused them to continue bleeding almost to death. Women did bleed to death. I just don't know women who bled to death. I know women who were on the brink. So today, it's... Uh, Today, we, we take all that for granted. But in Chazal's time, a woman was given all of these rights from the time the Torah was given. Where else did you find that a woman could own land? Where else do you find that a woman can sue men? Where else do you find that a woman has equal rights to men? You understand what that means? 
A woman could walk into court and sue a man? Where else did you find that? In the United yeah, States? The That's a different question. I said, the question is what you're focusing on. But as far as her rights... You're saying, does she, will she have that responsibility? No, that's a responsibility she's not given. There are many areas where we trust a woman, uh, and then there are areas where we don't trust a man either. Uh, look at, uh, we all eat. A woman tells you the food's kosher, you believe her. A woman tells her husband she went to mikveh, he believes her. So for sure we trust them. We, we build our whole lives around them. I said you want to analyze each one separately. We can well, analyze each one. There are areas, as we just described, right? There are different roles in society. But uh, if you look at the system, you will see that the system is not into making everyone the same. The system the Torah gives us is to treat each one with respect to their strengths and their weaknesses and and honor and respect and, and cultivate each one. So in her realm you see that she was given many, many perks and benefits. The, the woman was given many benefits. You're saying are there halachot where a woman uh, is not uh, given that responsibility? Yeah, for sure. But if, if you look at the halachot of running the house so you see that she has tremendous responsibility there. So in chinuch and education and bringing up the average home yeah, there's a realm of, uh, of being a, a judge. And still, you see, Dvorah was a judge. That's like saying, uh, should women be statisticians? Should women be... Uh, look at the, the courts today. How many women are lawyers? I'm saying, uh, with all the affirmative action, how many women are mathematicians? So from our perspective, learning Allah is like learning mathematics. Most women are not inclined to that. Most women, it, it won't go well for them. Torah says that's not a field for them. Fine. No. Factually, that's not so. Go to the United States, look at all the colleges that have tried for 30 years now doing affirmative action, and see how many women they have as top physicists. How many women do they have that are top mathematicians? And it's not because they're busy with the home. No, there's a difference between not, between not being inclined to a certain field and not being allowed to right. be in a certain field. But when the Torah understands the mentality of a woman. And so the Torah gives women the responsibilities in the areas that they're inclined to. And then modern science chooses to ignore a woman's responsibility, uh, inclinations and a woman's strengths. And modern science says, let's do affirmative action. Let's just get them into mathematics. Let's get them into physics. And it doesn't work. So then you say, oh, so maybe the Torah was on to something, right? Well, the statistics are flawed. Because the, 